This BYU devotional address with Steve Glover was given on May 13th, 2014. Good morning and welcome to our campus devotional. Today we'll have the opportunity of hearing from Stephen M. Glover, an associate dean in the Merritt School of Management. We welcome his wife, Tina, who is seated on the stand, as well as their family members and friends who have joined us today. Stephen M. Glover served as a full-time missionary in the Spanish-speaking California Ventura Mission. He earned his PhD from the University of Washington and currently serves as an associate dean in the Merritt School of Management. He served previously as the director of BYU's School of Accountancy. Professor Glover has authored several books and published articles in many leading academic and practice journals. He's been the recipient of the Merritt School's Teaching Excellence and Outstanding Research Awards. Brother Glover has held various church callings and currently serves as the bishop of his home ward. He and his wife, Tina, are the parents of four children. Their family enjoys boating, BYU sports, golf, and travel. We'll now have the privilege of hearing from Brother Stephen Glover. Good morning, and thank you, President Worthen. It's an honor to be with you today. When I received the invitation to speak at devotional, I thought back on how devotionals have been an important part of my life for more than 30 years. One of the first devotionals I remember was when I was a freshman at the school formerly known as Rick's College. I was raised in a faithful LDS home, and my patriarchal blessing said that I had a testimony through my earthly parents, which was true. But I was determined to strengthen my personal testimony of the restored gospel before I served the full-time mission. At age 18, I had another gospel-related concern. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, and most of my friends, coaches, neighbors, teachers were not members of the church. And using my developing powers of observation, I noticed that many of these people were happy. They were uh, interesting characters with a healthy sense of humor. And my concern, and probably none of you have this, is that at that time, my limited observation of senior church leaders was that they were quite formal and proper. As a young man, I had this nagging question, would the highest degree of heaven be a very nice but humorless place? The devotional speaker in January 1982 was the oldest living apostle at the time, 95-year-old LeGrand Richards. LeGrand was seven years old in 1893, and he was in attendance when President Wilfred Woodruff dedicated the Salt Lake Temple. Elder Richards rarely delivered a message from written text. He spoke from a lifetime of experience, study, and inspiration. I found uh, his talk, 1982 devotional talk, and I want to play just a minute of his remarks so you can get a sense for Elder LeGrand Richards. At this point in his talk, he's talking about attending a Sunday school conference as a young boy. The conference was taught by uh, brothers Carl G. Mazur and George Goddard of the General Sunday School Presidency. And I can remember to this day, and it's been over 80 years, the songs that Brother Goddard taught us to sing in that Sunday school conference. And when I didn't know I couldn't sing, I tried to sing with him. I don't do it anymore. <laughs> the first song goes like this. Take away the whiskey, the coffee, and the tea. Cold water is the drink for me. And then it repeats and goes on. <laughs> that made such an impression upon me as a boy. I've hardly been able to drink anything but cold water <laughs> since that time. I was riding on the train a few years back when we used to travel by train headed for California. And I went in the diner in the morning for breakfast. And the waiter said, are you ready for your coffee? No, thank you. Would you like some tea? No, thank you. Will you have some postum? No, thank you. Would you like a glass of milk? No, thank you. What do you want to drink? I said, a glass of cold water, please. He said, you're the funniest man I ever did see. <laughs> Elder Richards was a man of uh, wit and good humor. And my concerns about fitting in with people who qualified to return to our Heavenly Father just simply faded away that day. More importantly, as I listened to Elder Richards speak, 
from his heart and I heard his testimony, it deepened my faith in the restoration. He was a man of unwavering conviction in the truthfulness of the gospel. Here's a typical uh, Elder Richard statement. Uh, I truly love the work more than anything else in the world and I know it to be true. I could live better without the limbs of my body than I could without the testimony of the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of the Lord. The, the fact that Elder Richards had a personal connection to President Wilfred Woodruff, who was a member of Zion's camp, and to his great uncle Willard Richards, who was in Carthage jail with Joseph and Hiram Smith, made the restoration of the gospel all that more real to me. That day I stood in a long line to shake Elder Richards' hand. And I consider that day in the increased faith and testimony a tender mercy in my life. I had no doubt that Elder Richards knew the church to be true. But I, like you, would have to continue to build my testimony line upon line, precept after precept. After my mission, I attended BYU Provo for a semester and would have earned a degree here if it were not for a certain special young lady who would later become my wife. Tina was a flight attendant based out of Seattle, so after we were married, I transferred to the University of Washington to finish my degree. I had an experience in one of my first classes at the University of Washington that was interesting. It was a large general education class and the professor was obviously very smart and accomplished. He and a graduate teaching assistant had an exchange during the class where it seemed to me that they were criticizing religion. I went up after class and based on my now improving powers of observation, I say to the professor, seems to me you're criticizing people with religious beliefs. Uh, as an aside, do you know what the famous baseball player Yogi Berra says about observation? He says, you can observe a lot by watching. <laughs> so I say to the professor, it looks like you're criticizing religious beliefs. I don't remember much from the class, but I do remember his response that day. He said, yes, we find that the more education people get, the less they need the crutch of religion. But sounds a lot like a warning in the Book of Mormon. Oh, that cunning plan of the evil one. Oh, the vainness and frailties and foolishness of men. When they are learned, they think they are wise and they hearken not unto the counsel of God, for they set it aside, supposing they know of themselves. Wherefore, their wisdom is foolishness and it profiteth them not and they shall perish. I've met people who are once active members of the church and as they obtain additional knowledge, they set religion aside. However, we know that education and learning are not inherently bad. In the next verse in 2 Nephi, it states, but to be learned is good if they hearken unto the counsels of God. After completing my undergraduate degree, I worked in Seattle for a few years and then returned to the university to pursue a PhD. In graduate school, I was trained in the scientific method, which is a rigorous and careful approach to gaining knowledge. Now, my professional uh, specialty involves the procedure of techniques used by professional accountants to evaluate the fairness of financial statement information. Financial statements tell the story of performance of the company and management. Now, I don't know about you, but when I started talking about accounting, there's a spike in energy in the room. <laughs> and most of it may have come from this row right here of accounting professors. <clears throat> So professional accountants verify the fairness of what management reports by gathering and evaluating relevant and reliable information. They gather enough information to provide a high degree of assurance that the statements are fair. I'm gonna come back to that word assurance a little later. So this method of obtaining knowledge, like the scientific method, is similar to much of your academic work. In an excellent speech uh, delivered by former BYU president Rex Lee, he calls this method of knowing the rational process. He said, the rational process is one that you are accustomed to using in your academic work. Its tools should be familiar to all of you, reading, analysis, research, criticism, and general, generally problem resolution by thoughtful inquiry. Property applied is a strenuous, taxing, and frequently frustrating experience that results in the strengthening of the ability, our ability to use these processes. Through your past and present academic efforts, you're becoming increasingly expert in acquiring knowledge using the rational method. And our church leaders have repeatedly reminded us of the importance of this method. Modern day revelation emphasizes that we are to seek learning by study and also by faith and wisdom out of the best books. There's another method of knowing and President Lee called it the extra rational process, which comes through contact with godly things and revelation. President Lee said, Extra-rational learning takes a great variety of forms. 
The methods are not the same as the rational process. The results are much surer, though they are not as susceptible to our own control. It is this extra rational process that I want to explore further with you today. President Lee noted that there's a tendency for those who become strong in rational processes to downplay the importance of extra rational. Perhaps people believe that being excellent in rational processes can compensate for being weak in extra rational processes. In the Bible dictionary it states, knowledge of divine and spiritual things is absolutely essential for one's salvation. Knowledge is not obtained all at once, even by revelation, but line upon line, precept upon precept. I have observed people who fall away from the gospel and the church of Jesus Christ, and at least one of the reasons seems to be that their rational skills are stronger than their extra rational skills. One young person who has distanced himself from the church said he recognizes the many good aspects of the church and the gospel, but he currently doesn't see a need for organized religion. Another who's been out of the church for several years said he wouldn't be surprised if someday he returned to the church, he was just waiting for the right feeling that he should return. These comments seem to reflect a misunderstanding of the important elements of extra rational processes. In Hebrews 11, we read, now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If you look at the Joseph Smith translation of this verse, it reads, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So there's that word assurance. Recall that for professional accountants, obtaining a high degree of assurance involves a systematic process of gathering and evaluating evidence. Now, I realize there's just a small chance that when you read the word assurance, you don't initially or automatically link it to the work of professional accountants. Um, my daughters who are here will tell you that not all accountants are boring, but they can get excited about seemingly boring things. <laughs> so faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Is there a systematic way to apply extra rational processes to obtain a high degree of assurance for things hoped for? And if we follow a process like that, could we uh, attain the level of assurance that someone like Lorraine Richards had? A number of years ago, our family moved to the beautiful little township of Basking Ridge, New Jersey. I was on a two-year professional development leave from BYU while I worked for a large firm headquartered in New York City. Our neighbor, who was a town historian, uh, was quite surprised to learn that we'd be driving 25 minutes to a Mormon church when our township had three perfectly good, beautiful, historic Christian churches. A couple of weeks after being in our new ward, the bishop extended a home teaching assignment to me to visit John and Nancy Ferderber. John was a retired business executive and he looked to me like he was a former bishop. I was surprised to learn that John was not a member of the church. His wife and children had, were members and John had been very supportive of his children's involvement in church, their missions, temple marriages. John attended sacrament meeting with Nancy and had always been supportive of youth and scouting midweek activities. John shared his enthusiasm for sports with the youth. Here's a photo of John about 30 years ago. He was the longtime young women's basketball coach. He was particularly skilled at starting with beehives and through instructions and practice uh, turning them into ball players. John described himself as a dry Mormon. He said he always felt welcomed by the members, but he had difficulty accepting all that went along with being a Mormon. I remember our early home teaching visits with John and Nancy. John was quite interested in the business reasons for our move to New Jersey. I explained that when we came for home teaching visits, we would visit, catch up, and then we would uh, deliver a brief gospel message. John agreed. <clears throat> However, I quickly learned that John knew the home teaching drill very well. One time, apparently my lesson wasn't short enough, and John just turned to my young companion and said, how about that closing prayer? Uh, <clears throat> That meant John had had enough for the day. Uh, as we taught lessons of the restoration, I'd ask John, John, what are your religious beliefs? And he'd say, Steve, I'll tell you. I was baptized Catholic. I wasn't all that religious as a younger man, and now I choose to attend the Mormon church. And then quickly said, so you see, Steve, I've already been baptized. And I smiled and reminded John that we believed he would need to be baptized again by one holding the priesthood. To which John said, I understand. Maybe one of these days I'll take care of that. Nancy who'd never given up hope, hears that, looks over and says, what do you mean, one of these days? You're not getting any younger. 
A year or so went by, <clears throat> during which time the full-time missionaries stopped in to check on John, and they reported back to me, he is the nicest man, but not yet ready to accept the gospel. John kept attending sacrament meeting and accepting our home teaching visits, and as so long as I was good-natured, he let me uh, talk about how someday he'd be joining the church. Then John had a very serious health challenge that required surgeries. I remember after giving him a blessing in the hospital, John told us that he'd been impressed that this life is a time to carefully and seriously consider the things of heaven. He told me if he made it through the surgery, he would commit to retake the missionary lessons. After surgery, he said he felt watched over and realized he had been granted another chance. There were health complications and months of recovery, and all through it, John's heart continued to soften. The prayers of his wife, children, grandchildren, and ward members, and loved ones were heard. And he stated, <clears throat> he started to openly talk about the possibility and even the likelihood of being baptized. Our two-year leave uh, from BYU came to a close and we returned uh, to Provo. But we told John that, and John was still several months away from being baptized because of his health. Uh, we promised John that we would travel back to New Jersey for his baptism. When he was ready, John walked up to the full-time missionaries that following October and asked them what he needed to do to be baptized in early November. It was a beautiful service. Here's a photo of John and Nancy before the service. Imagine the scene as John entered the baptismal font. There was this large group of loved ones, Nancy, the children, all these grandchildren. Every time they got baptized, they'd say, Grandpa, you want to get baptized with me? They'd prayed for so many years uh, for this. When John came up out of the water, he smiled, and then he went like this. He raised his hands, and spontaneously went out this loud cheer from all these beautiful grandchildren. Uh, it's the first and only time I've attended a baptism with such a loud and joyous cheer, uh, but under the circumstances, it was totally appropriate. Here's a photo of John and Nancy just after they were sealed in the temple a year later. That's been over 10 years ago now. John said that he's so pleased to fulfill a promise and Nancy's patriarchal blessing that she would be married to an elder in the church. Together they've served as workers in the Manhattan Temple and they've served two church service missions. And we're honored that John and Nancy are here with us today. We could have John give one of these. <clears throat> there you go. So what lessons do we learn uh, from John about gaining assurance from extra-rational processes? We certainly see the power of a loving and faithful wife and family who offered countless prayers on John's behalf. John also always felt welcomed by the saints. Alma in the Book of Mormon teaches that the extra-rational process often begins with a humble and basic desire to believe. As the Word of God, like a seed, is planted in our hearts, it begins to swell, provides enlightenment, and enlarges the soul. John was humble, he had desire, he acted upon his spiritual promptings. I remember talking to John on the phone in the weeks following his baptism. He was learning so much about the gospel. He was surprised and a little nervous that he would be invited to teach the, whole, the, the priesthood lesson. What was clear is that even though John had sat through hundreds of sacrament meeting talks, without the benefit of the gift of the Holy Ghost, he hadn't retained much of that teaching. So to apply extra rational processes, we must have a sincere and humble desire to gain knowledge we must act in response to spiritual promptings, and the Holy Ghost is a great facilitator of obtaining assurance of spiritual things. If we ever find ourselves just going through the motions of attending Sunday meetings or offering prayer without sincere and heartfelt desire, we need to recognize that this is not an effective application of our extra-rational processes. As a teenager, David O. McKay desired to obtain his own witness of the truth. He describes riding his horse into the hills and finding a secluded place to offer a prayer, asking God for a testimony of the gospel. He fully expected he'd receive a manifestation that would remove all of his doubts. After uh, the prayer was done, he was riding home, and he asked himself, uh, he pondered the events, and he asked himself uh, what had changed. Quote, he said, quote, No, sir, there is no change. I am just the same boy I was before I knelt down." Close quote. The anticipated manifestation had not come. Even though he did not immediately receive a manifestation that he expected, he continued to apply extra-rational processes by humbly seeking 
with sincere desire and choosing to live a righteous life. He said, the spiritual manifestation for which I had prayed as a boy in my teens came as a natural sequence to the performance of duty. Answers to our prayers may not always come in an immediate and direct response to prayer or to time and a manner we anticipate, but they do come as we continue to do the will of God and they come in a time and a manner that is of, in our best interest. My great-great-grandfather, Morris David Rosenbaum, was born in Germany in 1831 to a Jewish family. At 11 years old, uh, Morris asked the rabbi why there are no more prophets or temples. And the rabbi explained those things were no longer needed, as the Old Testament was complete and comp contained all the necessary patterns. At age 19, Morris traveled to, to New York City for business, and some years later he traveled to San Francisco. In his travels, he heard about a Mormon settlement, and he was impressed to visit them. His religious discussions with the Mormon settlers made little impression on him, although he records in his journal the Mormons were the best people he had come into contact with. Morris applied an important principle of obtaining assurance of things hoped for when he described the Mormons as the best people he had come into contact with. He'd recognized the fruits of the gospel. The Savior taught, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. As you apply your extra rational processes, use your powers of observation to look around and examine the fruits of the gospel of Jesus Christ and his restored church. Do you see the blessings that can be in people's lives and in their families? Do you see the peace and joy that comes under any circumstances to those who faithfully live the gospel? I know that I have. When the settlement of Mormon uh, re relocated to Utah, Morris uh, decided to travel with them and spend the winter in Utah. Then he planned to return to Germany. In Salt Lake City, he heard Heber C. Kimball speak, and he recorded in his journal that it seemed to him he had heard the sermon before because he could anticipate what Brother Kimball was going to say. Morris then met Brother Nybauer, a member of the church who was from Germany and also of Jewish descent. Morris and Brother Nybauer had several discussions about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and at first Morris could not believe the teachings because they were so different from the teachings of his childhood. Little by little, he became more interested, and he said a peaceful, teachable spirit fell upon him. However, it's interesting what he records in his journal next. He said, when I listened to my selfish thoughts, it seemed to me I was deceived. I hated Mormonism and regretted ever hearing it. Morris describes selfish thoughts, perhaps because he knew the likely reaction from his parents if he were to join the church. As we use our extra rational processes to gather assurance of things hoped for, will we encounter selfish or doubting thoughts? And the answer is absolutely. We know particularly in these latter days, gospel principles will be attacked, and those attacks may come through seemingly rational arguments. When our beliefs are challenged, we have the opportunity to choose the peace and protection that comes through faith. Faith, though, is not a free gift. <clears throat> the Savior describes actions when he invites us, come unto me, or knock, and it shall be given you. President Thomas S. Monson has said, remember that doubt and faith cannot exist in the mind at the same time, for one will dispel the other. Whereas doubt destroys, faith fulfills. When Morris examined the fruits of his thought, he noticed that whenever he determined to have nothing more to do with Mormonism, he felt darkness. But when he studied the Book of Mormon and went to meetings, he felt surrounded by a peaceful influence and felt that he was being instructed the principles of the gospel by an unseen power. Morris records in his journal that one time after Brother Nybauer bore his testimony of, gospel, uh, of the gospel, Morris said, Mr. Nybauer, why cannot I have such a testimony? Brother Nybauer replied, Mr. Rosenbaum, I promise you in the name of Israel's God, you will. If you obey the principles of the gospel, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, then prayerfully ask Heavenly Father for it. Morris longed for such and a few days after chose to be baptized and confirmed a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Brigham Young later sealed Morris and his wife in the Salt Lake Temple and several years later, Morris served a mission to Germany. By the way, my grandfather Glover was also named Morris and my middle name is Morris. We learn important principles about applying extra rational processes from my great-great-grandfather's story. We must repent and be obedient. 
We must often take action before receiving the desired witness. Morris also read the Book of Mormon from cover to cover and had a strong conviction that the book was written by inspiration. It is said that when we wish to communicate with God, we do so through prayer. When God wishes to communicate with us, it is often through the scriptures. Our son is currently serving a full-time mission in Melbourne, Australia. Now we say Melbourne, but I have on good authority it's Melbourne. Uh, our son has worked with people <clears throat> who have sought baptism after they found answers to important questions while studying the Book of Mormon. We learn in Alma 37 that the scriptures are our own personal liahona. My experience is it doesn't matter so much where in the scriptures we are reading and pondering. The act of study and pondering opens the windows of heaven. Using my now keen powers of observation, I can tell you that the assurance you do obtain through extra rational processes can and will fade if you get lax in your church attendance and personal prayer and scripture study. In Amma 32, we, we read that even if the seed is good and grows into a, a tree that produces good fruit, if we neglect the tree, it will wither away. It withers not because the seed wasn't good or the fruit not delicious, but because of neglect and lack of nourishment. I testify that by the proper application of extra rational processes, there's a systematic way to leading to a high degree of assurance for things hoped for, even knowledge and surety of divine and spiritual things. I will close with a promise from our beloved prophet, President Thomas S. Monson, who in a BYU devotional taught, to those who humbly seek, there is no need to stumble or falter along the pathway leading to truth. It is well marked by our Heavenly Father. We must first have a desire to know for ourselves. We must study, we must pray, we must do the will of the Father. And then we will know the truth, and the truth will make us free. Divine favor will attend those who humbly seek it. That is a promise which I leave with you. Think of it. Close quote. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. This BYU devotional address with Steve Glover was given on May 13, 2014.